Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036369 0703 768 98 Email address lsmedia at or visit our website at www.livingseed.org Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. Practical steps onto partnering with your spouse. Let me ask Sister Shade to please lead us in reading as we take some of the scriptures. Yes, ma'am. Practical steps onto partnering with your spouse. Number one. Partnering not as equals and mates, but as the head and the body. And there are scriptures to read. Right, Sister Gata, you help us read Matthew 19, 4 to 6. When we look at First Peter chapter 3, we want to read verse 1 to seven. That's what we want to read there. First Peter chapter three from verse one to seven. And I will appoint Mrs. Okay to help us read Genesis two twenty three to twenty four and the right Reverend Kiana, you will help us to read Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. And Mama Bishop will read Ephesians 5, 22 and 23. Yes. Matthew 19, verse 4 to 6. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read? that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh so then they are no longer two but one flesh therefore what god has joined together let not man separate all right thank you okay First Peter chapter 3 from verse 1 to 7 Wives, in the same way be submissive to your husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reference of your lives your beauty should not come from outward adornment such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes instead it should be that of your inner self the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is of great worth in God's sight for this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful they were submissive to their own husbands like Sarah who obeyed Abraham and called him her master you are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear verse 7 husbands in the same way be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as hears with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers genesis chapter 2 23 and 24 and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. 
she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh Deuteronomy 22 verse 5 a woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man nor shall a man put on a woman's garment for all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God Ephesians 5:22 and 23 Submitting yourself one to another in the fear of God Wives submit yourself unto your own husband as unto the Lord for the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body Thank you very much we are beginning to look into the practical steps onto partnering with your spouse. Many times people think what we are talking about is not possible. Some imagine that, look, it's not easy. But this is only because the biblical principles of doing it has been modeled up. So in this first consideration, we are going to be discussing partnering not as equals and mates. Please, let's take note of this. Partnering not as equals and mates but as the head and the body I would like to open those discussions very briefly and then I'll be asking for contribution uh, from my wife and the prophets now in Matthew 19 a very big question came up and the question that the people asked, even though I doubt their sincerity, but they have brought their question, they wanted to uh, they wanted to test Jesus, tempting him, and they asked him, "Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause?" Of course, other versions we use. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? But I loved to take it from the King James perspective to put away. And for me, putting away, many, many putting aways is what becomes divorce. Ever before any couple comes to a level of separation, there have been so many, 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 many uncountable putting aways. Sometimes because of irritation, sometimes because of disagreement, whatever it is. Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? He answered. You know, the answer Jesus gave was very instructive. And I wanted to see what he said to them. Have you not read? Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, for this cause. Now, I just want to highlight on those two lines before I open it up now. I found that many, many reasons why people are not able to flow with themselves, with their wives or with their husbands, 
is first first a basic ignorance now and this ignorance no matter how old you are what you are ignorant of is your senior so Jesus said look it's not the question of whether you are putting away your wife for any cause the matter is you are ignorant have you not read so I found that whereas many many things people prepare for the marriage institution is what many many of us many people have never thought they need to study before they get into they just thought that once you find a beautiful lady that's okay you are ready without knowing that yes there are manufacturers manual that govern that relationship and there is need to read to study but what I noted was that Jesus Christ was not even recommending that they should go and read other philosophies or other materials did you see that he was simply referring them to the scripture and to God who is the manufacturer of marriage so when he said have you not read that he which made them at the beginning did not make them male and male he did not make them female and female so which means it was not sameness he didn't make them the same and they are not duplicates actually right from the beginning he who made them at the beginning made them differently he made them male and female and what is the meaning of that it means then that they are not equal and they are not the same so partnering not in the sense of sameness so we'll be emphasizing later on oneness rather than sameness oneness rather than duplication and so I saw Jesus Christ noting that look one of the things that you need to know is that he who made them at the beginning he made them male and female which means there are peculiar things about a male that makes him behave as a male and there are peculiar things that makes that makes a woman a woman and that makes her to think act operate as a woman now marriage does not change a woman to become a man and so the first thing is that in partnering we must make allowance for each one of us to be ourselves for example a male man is not made to weep over everything am I right if you see a woman I mean a man who is crying about everything say, ah, are you a woman <laughs> now and but sometime as a woman you were expecting your husband to cry when you are crying and you say he doesn't even love me eh? what touches me doesn't touch him look his eyes is just dry he doesn't care no he cares but he cares as a man not as a woman so if we are going to partner together Jesus Christ was noting 
that we must partner in recognition, in cognizance of the peculiarity even of our makeup. He who made them in the beginning made them male and female. Now, when we say male and female, I will begin now to ask uh, Sister Shade to, to help us have an insight. What is peculiar about a woman? How does a woman think? So that when you begin to see how your wife responds to certain things, you will not think she doesn't cooperate. She's cooperating, but she's cooperating as a woman can cooperate. Hallelujah. And when your husband is taking a step and you see him, you are talking and suddenly he says, okay, 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 that's all right. And he closes that chapter and he goes somewhere and he's doing something and says, okay, this man. We are talking a matter it has not finished and he has left. <laughs> because his own mind as a man does not operate like yours. So mom, please can you guide us? He who made them at the beginning made them male and female. So will you show us a bit what is it that is peculiar that we are not equals, we are not mates, Yes, ma'am. The first thing that um, touched me in that scripture, again, is the fact that when Jesus was answering that question, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And the answer that Jesus gave, uh, is the fact that it is not a matter of whether it is lawful or is unlawful. It's not a matter of sentiments and producing reasons to put each other away. The way Jesus answered, he, he did not concern himself with whether it's lawful or it's unlawful. He just simply told them that people put away their wives for lack of knowledge lack of understanding of what God made at the beginning it's not a matter of whether the law permits it or is our church doctrine or it is this or that the basic issue is the lack of understanding of how God made them at the beginning and if we are going to partner together it means we need this understanding it is this understanding that will help us to be able to, you know, to labor together, to partner together, whether in life or in ministry, in such a way that the kingdom of God will be advanced. So Jesus answered them and said, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And I felt if one will answer the question they asked, this is an indirect answer could have been yes it's lawful or no it is not lawful but he's talking about male and female and yet God made them so that they will be one and as he was discussing it is important to know that the male is different from the female and Jesus emphasized that male is not equal to female even physically you know, people talk about uh, equality and all kinds of things. But it's this lack of understanding that is pushing us into the bush. For God's sake, the male is not equal to the female. Even physically. Are we equal? <laughs> it's just not reasonable. Even physically, physical nature teaches us that the male is not equal to the female. There are basic differences. But despite the differences, God still wants them to be one and to partner together. Maybe because, again, of the basic, the way God made 
them at the beginning. In the sense that when he was making the woman, he simply removed something from the man to make the woman. And once he has removed that thing from the man, the man doesn't have it again. So he is not equal to the female. And once the female has it, the remaining bones in the man, this one bone is not equal to it. Wow. And you... it's important... No, go ahead. I'm just following you. <laughs> it's important for us to understand this so that we'll be able to accept one another's ministry. Because what has been removed from him let him walk from today till tomorrow. He can't get it until he cleaves to me. Let him go and look for prayer warriors somewhere. He won't get it until he turns to me. Wow. <laughs> that is the truth. That's the truth. Yes. <laughs> and in the same way, if I am looking for the remaining many bones that will make me complete, I can't get it anywhere else except in him that's where i'm i'm going nowhere it's not a matter of whether it's lawful or not it's just not reasonable mm. because what belongs to me is inside him why should he run away with what belongs to me i will run after him <laughs> hallelujah <laughs> that's good and what belongs to him is inside of me mm. he can't get it anywhere else so that forms the basis for us to partner together so that there will be wholesomeness in, in our lives and, and in our ministry. Mm. Now, the basic differences. There are studies that have been conducted, apart from what is obvious, like he said about um, uh, weeping. We all know that for women, weeping is just a normal expression of our emotion. It's just normal. And it comes without begging it. Hey. Tears come. You don't need to beg it. But for a man, ah, you have to do like this. <laughs> if there is <laughs> to produce one tear. <laughs> so, I think God also saw that in uh, Jeremiah chapter nine, from verse seventeen to twenty, when He was commanding the children of Israel because of their unrepentant hearts. And he told them, he said, consider, call for wailing women. Let them begin to wail. Maybe then your eyes will gush out with tears. Your tears are too far. Hey. God is talking and talking and they are not repentant. They are not, no remorse, no weeping for their sins. He said, maybe women should begin to cry. Then that may provoke tears from the men. And that's the truth. And as women, we need to know that men, the way men respond to things is different from the way women respond. Even though things are paining a man, he won't necessarily respond with tears. In fact, you just say, mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, may, he may just stand up and walk around the house. He's thinking, but you may say, look at him, I'm talking to him. He doesn't even care. You see him walking about. No, he cares. But the way he expresses his own care is different from the way a woman expresses it. For a woman, if something serious happens now that, that is painful to the emotion, the first thing is to weep. Before you know it, tears are coming. But the man, no. He doesn't respond. And we need to understand this. Even God noted it, that the male is different from the female in that respect. And I said, there are studies that have been conducted from uh, Britain over this matter of the basic differences between sexes, between the genders. And they outlined all those differences. And one of the differences stated that for a female, words are used to build relationship. 
words are used to express, you know, um, affection. affection. Mm. Words. But for a man, words are used just to, to bring reform. out what is in your heart for facts. Just to state facts. <laughs> so you will discover that when a man is stating a fact, and this fact is heavy, the first thing a woman will do is either to cry or to keep that word because words are treasures for a woman. When you speak, mind your words. Baba, if... are you hearing? Hear, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, these are the other side. You are hearing from this other side now. If you speak something good, if you speak appreciative words, if you speak loving and kind words, the woman will keep it in her archives. If it is through phone, you text her. She will keep that text. She can keep it for 10 years. If it's a letter, when you are cutting, Let some us. of us, uh, even me, I still have my letters. Wow! <laughs> are, are you hearing? Did you have your own too? <laughs> Sometimes... Sometimes I wonder, he doesn't write those letters now. Again. Except in a letter. Well, he does. <laughs> once in a long while. Wow. In the electronic media. But even those times, I keep it. Because honestly, for a woman, what's her treasures? It shows affection. It shows appreciation. And if you say another thing, as we have seen in, you know, during uh, counseling, that some men that say terrible things about their wives, they cause a lot of havoc. The woman also keeps it. And for years, she will be telling you, eh, eh, ah, do you want to touch me? Eh? One woman, the husband, right from honeymoon, because of difficulties that they were passing through, just burst out and say, ah, ah, why are you so, so stubborn? Eh? Are you Satan? Why do you destroy, disturb me and disturb our progress? Are you Satan? Eh? Then the woman kept it. For the next eight years, that home was about to break. And the problem is, eh, you want to touch me? Do you want to touch Satan? No. Ah. Maybe you call me Satan. How will you now touch Satan? And it was becoming a matter. So, for a woman, words are heavy. They are, they are to express emotions, express affection, express, you know, to, to build. But for a man, it is to express a fact. So, it's important for a man to understand this difference. So that you will relate with your wife with understanding. And also for a woman, it's important to know that your husband is not a woman. He is a man. It is this by, I mean, this mutual understanding that will enable us to be able to partner together without much problems, so, understanding the differences. So this may be the reason why what a man tells a woman, she keeps remembering it. You said it. And then many times the other say, when did I say it? I can't remember that I said such a thing. Because to him, he has only passed an information. And as the information has passed, the words have passed with it. Do, do, do you understand that now? He will say something, he doesn't know that it has any implication or effect. So the wife said, but you, you said it. He said, when did I say it? He said, when you were sitting at the edge of the bed, you remember, when we use, when I used to use a, a blue bed sheet that night, when I was asking you about where is the candle, this is what you said. <laughs> you said, how could you remember all of those details. 
because just like he said words they are treasures they are communication of affection of evaluation a woman feels you are evaluating her by your words and so many many times several women they are feeling starved when a husband does not have time to talk to them whereas the man I also even discovered that when, when a man is speaking to his wife the wife is not only listening the wife is also concerned about his facial expression and the woman say he's even talking to me but he's not looking at me he's reading something we are talking and he's reading something he doesn't care the man say go on go i'm hearing i'm hearing i'm hearing he say oh no <laughs> i'm talking say yes i'm hearing now go ahead i've heard what you have said the woman never believes because to her words communication is an expression of affection of care of concern and of love. So, <laughs> Sister Gata, yeah, there's still more. One more, one more from her before we go ahead. Oh, okay. Yes. There are many of these differences actually, but you know, the other one I want to talk about is the fact that for a woman, the home environment is a place to build relationship. That's why even when a woman has come back from work and she's tired, she's never tired to relate with her husband, to talk to him. Ah, do you know what happened at work today? Hey, come and see oh, this attendant. Do you know what she did? And, you know, just to build a relationship. But for a man, the home environment is a place to, to rest, to sleep, to relax. <laughs> we are in trouble now while the woman is trying to you know build a relationship to you know want uh, affection to talk and communicate and relate the man said oh i'm tired i want to rest can't you let me rest for god's sake i will listen to you later and that later will never come <laughs> and so because of this there will be quarrel And we need to understand this for one another. Whereas the man could be busy and so busy at work. Please, when you get home, don't forget to give attention to this matter of building relationship with your wife. At home. At home, not at work. Hmm. At home. And as you give time, give space give room for discussions for relationship let her tell you what has happened at home in your absence and let her be fulfilled as a woman this will enhance the building of our relationship and in the same way as women when you talk please don't forget that for a man the home is a place to rest if you know he is quite tired give him room to rest but when he finishes resting, you can then talk your talk. Hi. It's very important for us to consider this so that nothing will stand between us. Because once there is something between us, a quarrel, a misunderstanding, partnering together will be difficult. Hi. One more. One more. <laughs> she has one more, so let's go ahead. <laughs> now, let me talk about the differences even in outlook that there is a difference between the male and the female 
even in the physical outlook, there is a difference. The way God made it. Just physically looking at the body of the male and the female is different. And it's important to allow that difference. I don't want to talk about all the struggles between the gender dressing or not. But I'm now talking about something, you know, that is deeper than that. That the male is different from the female. Even on bed, on the conjugal bed, the male response is different from the female. And it's important also for us to understand this. So that our conjugal relationship will not be difficult. We will not be selfish. Because as the man wants to enjoy it, the woman also wants to enjoy it. And not to understand each other will bring a lot of discomfort. For a woman, what brings conjugal arousal is different from that of the man. For the man is the eyes. The thing is in the eyes. What is here? Yeah, finish. <laughs> That may be why Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why should I behold a maid? And David, when he will fall, he fell on the laps of Bathsheba because of his eyes. So for a, for a male, once he sees, he can be aroused. And... <laughs> Even if they are still quarreling, this guy... <laughs> and as... As women, don't forget that our husbands are first of all men before they are pastors. Are you hearing that? I, I, want, the, I want the women to answer me now. That your husbands, they are not first of all pastors. They were men. Real men. Raw men. <laughs> before they became pastors so go ahead mama. and what they see you know sometimes just admiring you alone can bring sexual arousal we should not resist them but for the women what brings arousal is not in the eyes it's in the ears good words kind words affectionate words don't let don't be stingy with i love you there are some men they have never told their wives that they love them oh my god you women am i talking we are, here. <laughs> we are following you now you know sometimes you think because you are a pastor you have married a spirit <laughs> your wife is first of all a woman before she is spiritual let's note that for a woman the difference is that what brings conjugal i mean sexual arousal is in what she hears if you if there's something that you have appreciated not to flatter not to tell lies but if you have appreciated something about her if there is something you have seen about her say it out don't swallow it and say ah you should know i love you now must i say it we want to hear it. Uh. <laughs> See, don't be stingy with words. Otherwise, conjugal relationship will be difficult. Because what she hears is what goes into the system to bring arousal. And that brings lubrication during conjugal relationship. I'm sorry if I'm going a bit medical, but I think it's important for us to also understand with one another and respond to each other even on the bed. A gentle touch, a loving word can bring sexual arousal for the woman, but for the, for the man, just the eyes is enough. Which means the man responds to you know, sex faster than the woman. Whereas she is waiting for what you will say. She is waiting for the gentle, loving touch. He has already 
is ready. It's important for us to learn to wait for one another so that we can enjoy one another. There is a basic difference between the male and the female. Let me confirm. Are you following this discussion? <laughs> eh? Men of God, are you hearing us? These are tips from the other side. Right. You wanted to say something. I just want to give additional tips. Um, but just before I give the additional tips, just like uh, our brother said, to ignore what the word of God is saying about our relationship in marriage is like to throw the manufacturer manual away and yet want to enjoy the product or maximize the use of the product. And that was why Jesus was referring them to the manual. And uh, if you go to Genesis 1 verse 27 and Genesis 5 verse 1 and 2, yes, husband and wife are not partnering together as equals at all. There are, there are peculiarities. But if you look at those two places, the woman also carries the image and likeness of God. And that is why in First Peter, the man is asked to walk with her according to knowledge and that she's a joint heir of the grace of life. So especially a woman in Christ, she has been restored to that grace of life, not for competition, but for the fact that she is capable of being a child of God and being used of God. Then another thing is any attempt to turn your husband into a female, you will be frustrated, you will frustrate him, and you will be negating the plan of God. Mm. So many of us, sometimes we try to make the man to behave like a woman. You know, to tidy the places, very few of them are tidy, actually. Uh, and to do everything like that, mm. that will be trying to make your husband a woman. And you will be frustrated. So why look for frustration? Try to play the role that God has brought you to play. I want to say that your wife is not general woman. Uh, the Bible says, walk with her according to knowledge, which means, don't say women are like that. No, your wife. Your wife is your, your wife. wife. Uh. She is different. And you must know her and deal with her as a different woman. She's unique. Special. Yes, she's unique. My husband has been doing some little research recently, and he discovered that women are capable of producing 30,000 words a day. Hello? While the man, while the man at most can produce 20,000. So there's a gap of 10,000, even for a talkative man and a wife. Yeah. Uh, so, wow. I'm just buttressing what our sister has said. Because we are expressive. We like to, to find somewhere we can open up and say how we feel. And when we are able to say it to a listening ear, it is a first step to our healing. Mm. But no, no godly woman has to produce 30,000 words a day. Because in too many words, sin is not lacking. Women are more detailed too. While the man has the bigger picture, women have the details to do the, put the fillers. So bring the big picture and allow the fillers to come in. You know, and women are also whole. They are whole in their relationship. That means what happens in the morning and the one that happened in the mid-morning and the one that happened in the evening, they are all connected. Whereas for the man, they are in compartments. Everything is different. This one has finished. This one has finished. While for me, everything is joined. They are all piled together. They are linked. Many times, when you come later and you want something at the bottom of the line, 
there has been so many things that are pressing that one down. And you have to offload it. Yes, you have to offload. You have to offload for the woman because, as our sister rightly said, it is relational. How did you relate during the day? Apart from the nice words, apart from the touch, how did you relate during the day? How did you handle the children's school fees? Yes. She's those, concerned. Those are the relationships. He said, but leave that, leave that. Uh -huh. Let's do this first. Yes. <laughs> after that, after we finish, we can talk about children and say no. Yes. Let's talk these children first. Let's say to that. Yes. You so say, for, for why her? have you been difficult? Yes. And you're always difficult. I <laughs> said, let's just do this thing quick, quick, quick. It won't last. <laughs> the woman said, no. Let's so, say to this first. So for her, all of them are connected. Well, well, for the man, sex is a priority. For the woman, there are other priorities. Uh, we had a practical experience in our relationship. Um, a few years of our marriage, my husband went to Cameroon, and that was the first time he was leaving home for three weeks after our marriage. And he came back, arrived just, and rushed to Maiduguri to meet his wife. For him, the agenda was one. Yes, now. Uh -uh. <laughs> he has been away now. <laughs> well, for me, the agenda were plenty. I to tell him the me. stories, how long, the things that happened in his absence, the uh -huh. children, and everything. Those were my priorities. Said, Let that wait first. <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> we do that tomorrow. <laughs> So, I, I, I think it is very, very critical for us to understand this. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Baba, you want to say something on this before we go away? <laughs> are you enjoying this class today? Yes. We are talking about how to partner together because they are not the same. They are not seeing it the same way. And the need to harmonize by recognizing these peculiar differences. Yes, sir. Just to add that the differences is actually genetic. It has to do with even the setting in the brain. That's what I'm discovering recently. You know, for the woman, the left-hand side of the brain dominates. And that's actually the one that controls communication and other things like that. For the man, it's the right side. But again, while the woman can use left side of the brain and the right hand at the same time, the man cannot do the same. That is why, you know, studies have shown that for the woman, her brain is like a video. It doesn't escape any detail. She captures events. But for the man, the brain operates like a steel camera that you can only snap one at the same time. You know, chuck and then chuck. So while she can narrate only events, the only the important things he captures. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> so if, listen now, we're here. Those that came with their wives, if they go home and they were to give report of this conference, how long do you think they will report it? But if the man who came alone here, as soon as he arrives, the wife is saying, welcome. How was it? How was the meeting? How did it go? What does the man of God say? Fine, very fine. <laughs> Praise God. Uh -huh. You mean the meeting held? And the people came. How is Brother Billy? He ah, he's very fine. Just thank God. Everything just went well. We thank God. Amen. Where's my food? <laughs> the wife is expecting that you've been away for four days. You should give her details of how things went. And you should stretch your leg so that you can also hear what happened on Monday, what happened in the, in the evening on Tuesday, and when the children went to school, what happened, and how the car behaved. 
She has all those details. Say, well, it's all right. We just thank God for everything. Amen. He will report four days of meeting in five minutes. Very frustrating. Do you know that for men, many of us, there are many things you thought you have told your wife. Because your mind has captured one important thing there, the all other things are not very serious. Another one, that's all. And by the time you put one, two, three, you are finished. Say, so, well, that's it. We thank God. Everything is nice. It's okay. Amen. Um, so, and then he's doing his hand like this, and he's going inside like a rat. He will just be bringing his hand. Do I say no? You have not even listened to what I was saying. Say, say it quick, 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 quick. When the woman start telling the story of how we took off from the from the park, ah, that day when we it rained, eh? <laughs> when we got to Okini, in fact, I started counting the number of trailers. There were more than 200. We were there in the ghost low. And do you know what happened? In that ghost low, one boy was selling granite. <laughs> the husband is already snoring. <laughs> because, because to him, there's no connection. But to the woman, it's all one story. The mind of the woman is a pile. Whereas the mind of the man is a shelf. He picks out what he wants to discuss from the shelf. And when he finishes, he puts back and takes another one if he wants. That's why a matter may never finish, he has switched off. So why we are discussing this is that Jesus said, he who made them in the beginning, he made them male and female. And the beauty of it, which we want to refer to, he said, and he said, for this cause, shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and they shall become one flesh for this cause and I wonder for which cause and my wife was explaining I said the cause, the reason why it is not whether it's lawful or not lawful, it's not a question of law when you start quoting constitution to one another in your marriage, you are finished because you didn't read constitution when you were proposing to her do you remember that you never it was not about law. It's about something else. The love of God. So he said for this cause. That which has been taken out of the man is in the woman. And for that cause you must cleave. Not to lose what belongs to you. Praise the Lord. So when the Bible said you must relate to her according to knowledge. That is, and our sister is pointing out that your wife is not a general woman. Your wife is unique. And she's peculiar. And you need to know the woman that God gave you because that is the bone of your bones and the flesh of your flesh. And in the same way God said to the wife, wives, Submit to your own husband. That's your own. It's very prominent in those Bible verses. Your own. Not just any man. Whatever your own husband is, that's your own husband. Hallelujah. That's the one that God gave you. That's the one that carry the bones 
And it is out of him that God has made you who you are. Submit to your own husband. Now, let me raise one more issue before we move away from here. We read 1 Peter chapter 3. Can I refer back to 1 Peter chapter 3 very quickly before we jump out of this? Uh, in like manner, likewise, wise, be subject to your own husbands. So that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When we look at the word submit or be subject, the way the Amplified Bible explained it off, he said, you married women be submissive to your own husbands, and he meant subordinate yourselves. as being secondary to all and dependent on them and adapt yourselves to them so you see when we are beginning to talk about this partnering it is important to note that god has also made allowance and why the brethren were talking and they were talking about the peculiarity of i mean the the uniqueness and the difference of the male and the female. I was going to note that there was one more something peculiar about a woman that I think we should not forget. I think God did it. A woman can easily adapt. A woman has capacity to do what? To adapt. And this is why Husbands, can I beg you? You don't have capacity of adaptation like your wife. Sometime, even in the management of resources at home, I think if we are going to be very, very honest, if God gives you a, a good wife, she will be the best manager of your resources. If you put money in your wife's hand and she knows that this is all we have, if she knows, and she knows that you are honest, and she knows that no matter how she weeps, there's nothing anywhere else, do you know that you will never lack food in the house throughout the month? She knows how to adapt. But not men. I'm not saying that men don't adapt at all. But their level and capacity of adaptation is not the same. Men are generally rigid. They operate in grids. Greed. And if you don't fit into that greed, everything is scattered. But the wife has a way of coiling around and filling up and fitting in. And God is saying, wives, you have capacity to adapt to your husband. Stop insisting. Subordinate yourself to him. You are a helper. You are here to help, not to dictate. So when we are partnering, many, many, many times, you come to a situation where the husband is rigidly putting his feet on the ground. If you decide not to adapt, your marriage will scatter. And you know the trouble is that he may have problem talking with you. But when it is time to go and preach, yeah, we discuss when we return. Thank you. God bless you. And he carries his Bible. And that same man goes on the pulpit and he preaches with fire. And the wife is sitting down there. 
crying. Say, really? <laughs> this man. How did you switch? He has switched. So, why is according to scripture you have capacity to do what? To submit, to adapt. To bend and fill up the space for the man. Why we tell husband to be tender, to be gentle, to be considerate. The only thing that God has asked you to do, and you would enjoy your marriage, submit to your own husband. Your own. There are wives that would like to submit to the other man of God. But not her husband. I said, if not that uh, uh, Baba Bishop spoke, you will have seen something here. But I, I, I thank God for the bishop. Now, that does not complement your marriage at all. Baba Bishop is not your husband. Your own husband. Submit to him. Adapt to him. And as you adapt, something will happen. You will soon discover that you have got him. He said, even if they do not obey the word, they may be won over without a word, without discussion, when they see the conduct of your lives as a wife. Praise the Lord. Partnering in cognizance of peculiarities of roles and responsibilities, complementary and contributory. We've read Ephesians chapter 22 to 23 before. What we want to read now is verse 21 and 23. Uh, Baba Pofi, would you like to try it? Ephesians 5, verse 21 and 23. Submit to one another out of reference for Christ. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. You know, I'm thinking that we wanted to add 21, 22, 23 not 21 and 23. I think it should be 21, 22, 23. Please, just put a dash to show that it's 21 to 23. And what we are dealing with there, there are, each of it is very important. Verse 21 says, submitting yourselves one to another. The submission that we bring partnering, effective partnering in our marriages, demand that we submit to one another. We submit to one another in the areas where she has the strength. What do I do to that? I submit to her wisdom. And in the aspect where I have the capacity, what should she do? Submit. We submit one to another. Partnering already shows that I cannot go it alone. So there are things that she's the one that has the capacity to show me how to do. What do I do? I submit. When I submit to my wife, that does not mean weakness. It only means wisdom. I'm only being very strong. And when my wife submit to me, that does not mean she's not intelligent. She's simply being actually wise so that we can move on together. He now says, submitting one to another in the fear of God. That's the first thing. In the light of God's will. For our lives, we must submit one to another. But then he now goes on and says, Wives, 
submit yourselves unto your own and the emphasis your own husband as unto the Lord I sense that that is important that actually is not even just because of him it's because it's to the Lord so you don't size your husband up and say what are you talking about huh is it because I marry you that you are now talking? I had better suitors before we married. I just humble myself to marry you. Now you are talking. Let's leave that issue. How long will that woman be in that family? Not too long. She's looking for, for blows. My sister, no matter what you have read, you have your PhD, you have everything. Can you please drop it and submit to your own husband? It doesn't have to be a professor. It's your own, own husband. That's the one God has given you. Submit to him. Honor him. Go with him. And now, husbands. The Bible is giving us our instructions. So for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of it. And I was wondering when that scripture came like that. Very heavy responsibility. Very heavy responsibility that God is saying, just as Christ is the head and the savior of the body. That's how Husbands must take stand. You must know that, look, you are not a driver. You are the savior. You are the one that provides cover, direction. If a man's head scatters now, if you have head injury, finished. Please don't forget that if you don't stand well, everything will collapse. Praise the Lord. Now, can I take any other input from you here? Uh, we're talking about partnering in cognizance of the peculiarities of our roles. The husband is the head and the wife, we're told, submit as, 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 as unto the Lord. Any, anything you want to help us do? First, in that verse 21, submission is mutual. And that's one of the characteristics of life within the body of Christ. Mutual submission. But the aspect that I want to comment on is partnering in cognizance of peculiarities with just a small story of what happened to us just two weeks after our wedding, which I didn't know, and we quarreled, and we didn't go to preach together. Uh, two weeks after our wedding, I had an invitation to preach somewhere. Everything was going very smoothly between us. And that morning, I came out and was waiting for my wife to come out. And when she came out, eventually, I saw her with a black bulletin back. And I asked her, what, were, what are you carrying? She said, guinecon. Guinecon, sir. We were going to preach, but she was carrying guinecon. So I asked her, what are you going to do with guinecon? That since where we are going, there is a grinding machine there. You know? That after the church service, we will branch and grind. And you like Kuno now? <laughs> but I didn't see the connection between preaching <laughs> and carrying guinecon, because we were praying about preaching, not about grinding. And we began to argue. I said, no, leave it. When we come back, we'll, we'll escort you to grind. She said, no, that will be a double job. And before I knew it, the small girl told me that, okay, since you don't want me to carry guinecon, I will worship here. You go. <laughs> and she left. <gasps> and it was a quarrel that we didn't settle until 2.30 a.m. of the following day. Now, what was she doing that? She was just being a female she knew that after preaching there must be eating that 
and you will never be patient. And I will not be patient. I know you will come back hungry and say, exactly. where's my food? Exactly. So I think that I just chip that in so that we'll know that sometimes what spoils the ministry is actually because we do not understand these peculiarities between each other. Thank mm. you. The last time you want to help us. Okay. You know the major issue. Sometimes you are going to preach and your wife is parking. And you sit there and say, Let's go now. It's time. He said, I'm coming. Then she comes out. She said, There's something I forgot. <laughs> you say, oh God, what is all this now? What is all this now? Then eventually, you get into the car you are going. Then when you're about to enter church, you put your hand in your, in your pocket and say, Where is my handkerchief? Where is my handkerchief? No handkerchief. And you are doing your hair like this. And you say, Can I? You say, Well, when I told you that I forgot something, that was what I went to pick for you. Because I know you will need handkerchief. So she will bring it out from her bag. That's why they always have heavy bags. <laughs> <laughs> Those heavy bags, they contain miscellaneous. <laughs> so you see, the point is that when we are talking about partnering, don't forget that it is your wife that has that capacity to anticipate. May God give you a wife. Yeah. Whoso finds a wife finds a good thing. Honestly speaking. They have capacity to anticipate what has not yet happened. Sometimes your wife will remember to carry a bottle of water inside. He knows that when you start preaching, you are likely to cough. And why you are doing like this, she will just open that same bag, the bag of miscellaneous, <laughs> and bring you that small bottle as a take. And you are lubricated, you go on. When you don't have a wife that packs for you, if I were to ask brothers and those that didn't come with their wives, and your wife was not home, when you are packing, if I ask you now, and you want to be honest, you will notice that when you arrive at any resort, then you discover that you didn't carry so. Some of you forgot your toothbrush. Say, so where can I get brush here? Others, it was their comb that they thought they have already packed only to go to the barn, you find that your comb is nowhere to be found. But if Madame was home when you are coming, what does she do? She will put everything together. Put everything together. May the Lord help you to please cherish the woman that God has given you. They are not a nuisance. They are a blessing. And we are asking that please partner together with them in cognizance, in recognition of those peculiarities. God knew you that that's how you are. And he said, I will make a help meet for him. Before we finish this uh, clinic today, I'm hoping that you will have a little time to whisper some words to our ears. Eh? And to say, I'm sorry that I have never been telling you this. I may not have succeeded without you. Thank you for being my wife. Can you tell her that? But when, when <laughs> you, you want to do it, do it quickly. 
do it quickly, quickly, quickly. Okay, stand away from that, my Lord Bishop. Go and meet your bone right now. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you, sir. Yes. Yes. I just wanted to also add a little in this Ephesians 5.21 that even where the wife, there are areas of strength that the husband can submit to and vice versa, there could be a stalemate sometimes. And where the man says no, it must be done in a particular way. Uh -huh. As a wife, he is head and leader. Somebody should have the final say. The husband is the accounting officer. He is the one God will call to answer for whatever happens in the home. So when there is a stalemate as a wife, when you have explained and as wonderful as the idea may be, if the husband insists that it must go the way he wants it to go, Biblically, he is the head. So you submit to, for him to do the one he wants. When you are very sure that that's not what God wants, you go back to God and talk to God. I like doing that one. Because when God speaks to somebody that is a child of God and obedient to God, he will listen to him and he will obey God. Uh, and many times... We get angry as wives. We may not even like to talk to him because he didn't accept your wonderful idea. But I have discovered that going back to tell the, the man, the person whose king's heart is in his hand, when I tell him, he knows how to tell my husband Praise to Lord. do the right thing. Thank you very much. I have been signaled that this clinic has to close. We trust God that you will press on with this. Again, we commend to you some of the materials that we have worked upon that we are expecting that you can together make use of. We don't have those books here today, but maybe if you check at the book stand, they may have some. There are some uh, materials that we have been discussing through so we just want to leave the few minutes we have left if there are questions or remarks or observation tell us how you feel about this clinic if you have any question we can take it the clinic is a continuous clinic we trust God to help us uh, any hands please lift it up there's a hand all right, please go quickly and pick that hand. Stand up and they will bring you the microphone. Yes. Thank you. Uh, brother, I have a question and the other one is an observation. I want to ask, please, do you operate one account with your wife? Yes, sir. Good. Yes, sir. Okay. The observation there is this. Because there are no more two. Okay. Yes, sir. The observation I want to make is that I've observed that many leaders operate se uh, separate accounts, separate, separately, and their wives also operate their own accounts. Then, on the other way, I have also ob observed that many leaders like to choose either their first son or their first daughter as the case may be as next of kin i want to be very frank many leaders choose either their first son to be next of kin or their first daughter as next of kin as the case may be why sometimes they feel either of them will die before the other and before the other one will die the other one will become old and the son will be there to actually 
retrieve or get everything as a, be a beneficiary of the things that belong to the man. It's an observation. Thank you. Thank you. Even though we have no hard space to talk about this, let's note that when God joined you and your wife together, you became one flesh. And you jointly own everything. Beginning from when you start buying small, small Bibles or something, put your two names there together. Let your children know that you are one. They cannot come in between you. When you are speaking, sit together as husband and wife and speak to your children. Hallelujah. Don't let them be rooting in between the two of you. Now, we didn't have time to talk about the matter of operating accounts. But we just want to say generally that when God made you one, all about you have been joined together. If there were reasons why accounts have to be done uh, separately or somehow, uh, it should still be discussed properly so that you are not keeping an account that your wife does not know about. Don't do that because in case anything happens and you are gone, those uh, bankers, they will chop it. They will chop it. Make her the first signatory. Usually when you are talking about filling forms, nest of kin and all of that, there is always the first nest of kin. And there's a provision for another. So we want to cancel that your first nest of key is the wife, is the husband that God gave you. She came first before the children. Oh, am I am I saying well? Eh? The children came after, and they are passengers. They will soon drop. But when the two of you have bound your life together, you own everything together. When you are buying land, let them write your seal of O in the name of the two of you. That settles it. And when you are deciding together, if any of us should go away first, it's no problem. There's already a room for who is the next after that. So, I don't think we should be in trouble with that. Now, our Baba Kwashi said yesterday that the problem of culture has overrun many, many marriages because we forget that we are Christians and not traditional people. So can we first allow what Jesus says about our matrimony to hold sway while everything else comes behind? Thank you for that observation. God bless you. There's one more hand here. Please take the hand in front there from the archbishop and then. Um, it is said that uh, the woman's heart has to be as malleable as that of a little child. And uh, in a situation where a woman for any reason keeps a catalog of offenses instead of flushing them from her memory, my brother, won't it affect her prayer life? When we talk about the differences 
it is for us to first of all understand that uh, the issue of keeping offenses is not even just the woman that we should talk about even the man it's not only the woman's heart that should be like that of the child jesus talked about every christian each one of us should be he said unless you are converted and be like a child you will not enter the kingdom of god so whether a man or a woman the matter of forgiveness is very crucial we shouldn't keep offenses we shouldn't be keeping record of wrong the bible says love doesn't keep a record of wrongs so it's a matter not just of the woman but also of the man if we are going to partner together offenses we must know how to handle it and handle it like jesus he forgives and if we are going to become like christ we also must be ready to forgive at all times peter said how many times is it 70 times seven said ah um, is it uh, seven times and jesus said 70 times seven before you start counting 70 times seven in a day even you yourself you must be something the very important thing is to forgive otherwise your prayers will be hindered so whether for a man or for a woman we are not to keep a record of wrong and just to say even though we have said women treasure words a Christian woman must not keep junks don't keep your heart with junks you don't have two hearts and husbands the Bible says let your word be seasoned with salt that it ministers grace to those who hear I found that peculiarly when God wants to address men he has always told men for example in Colossians 3 we say do not be harsh with your words is a peculiar need a problem in the life of many men because you want to express an idea you want to say something that just jump on your heart many times men speak words that are weighty without weighing how much what you are releasing now is going to cause damage so husbands please do not forget to be considerate in what you say to your wives and may I use this to conclude in my little contribution to this we have said women keeps words they keep their letters they keep their texts pastors I will feel that since you are not very young pastors I should not say this but ah how will I not when you write texts to girls to sisters in the fellowship or in the church be careful they are keeping it so when you are so moved and say Dali you know we love you and I'm thinking seriously about you God bless you you have said something it will land somewhere that you don't know she will read it 30 times be very careful is that okay don't send text to sisters when your words can be misunderstood it were better to speak than to commit yourself in writing they will produce it too. one day you said you said this you wrote me what do you mean if you didn't mean this the Lord will help us 
There may be many widows in the church. You are not the husband of widows. <laughs> Jesus is the husband of widows. Be careful. So that you don't make a shipwreck of your ministry. Thank you very much for the opportunity for us to have this uh, time together. We are going to pray. We don't have more time to take all the questions, but we are praying that the Lord will bless you as you go. I want to give an advice. The reason why we went to the extent of putting the paper in your hand is that you can take it back to study. Take it and study. We've not finished. We are trusting that you can draw on with it. As husband and wife, you can study it. Please, when you lay hand on the no more to or the building a fruitful marital relationship, a group of studies that we have been using, and the treasures in a woman, or what makes a woman spiritual, or the dignity of manhood, how to be a real husband. And some other materials that you'll find. Last year, I introduced a book by one of our resource persons, Effective Parenting. And you might get to the bookshop and find other helpful materials. We want you to work and build your matrimony. The Lord will bless you. We would like to stop here. Would you like to conclude with us in prayer again? Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you so much for this forum. Lord, for using it to speak to our different situations. We are so God that as ministers and partners that we will watch our lives and watch our families also. Thank you so much, we pray, that you will help us in our families to represent you as we minister together, that we will give you first place in our lives and in our families. Father, where there are families that are in pain, we plead that you bring healing in the name of Jesus. Where there is division, Lord, we ask that you will bring reconciliation. Where there is love lost, Father, we pray that you revive it. Where there is lack of submission, Lord, please, we pray that you will rekindle that. First, Lord, that we will love you with the whole of our hearts, with the whole of our minds, and with the whole of our strength. And that we will love our partners as ourselves. Thank you for bringing us to the end of this session. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.